Okay, here we have question one on paper four. Part AI, state what is meant by gravitational potential at a point. So this is a standard definition for two marks. It is the, hang on a minute. It is the work done per unit mass, because it's potential, not potential energy, moving a mass from infinity to a point. And if you fail to say per unit mass, you will lose one mark. Second part, suggest why for small changes in height near the Earth's surface, gravitational potential is approximately constant. So again, we're talking Earth's surface, small changes, and it's two marks. So we need to mention two points. Um, so near the Earth's surface is about the change in height. So uh, the change in height at the surface is a lot less than the radius of the Earth. And as a potential is inversely proportional to 1 over r, if the radius is approximately constant, uh, approximately constant, then the potential is approximately constant. So it's more about the fact that if you change height near the Earth's surface, the ch th that difference in height, whether it's 10 meters or even 8,000 meters, is so much smaller than the radius of the Earth at about 6,000 uh, kilometers that we can assume that the radius is roughly constant, so the potential is roughly constant. The last part of this question for, four, uh, for three marks caught a lot of people out. So the moon may be considered to be a uniform sphere with a diameter of 3.5 times 10 to the 3 kilometers and a mass of 7.4 times 10 to the 22 kgs. A meteor strikes the moon and during the collision a rock is sent off from the surface of the moon with initial speed v. Assuming that the moon is isolated in space, determine your minimum speed of a rock so that it does not return to the moon's surface. Now, where people got into difficulty with this question is they assumed that when the rock went off, it was moving in circular motion. I think a lot of the times in your revision, you may have just seen that a lot of the questions involve uh, centripetal force and equating it to gravitational field, uh, force. But it's not the case in this question. There's no mention that it's moving in a circular motion. It's about the escape velocity. How fast will it need to go so that it's not recaptured by the moon's gravity and goes back to the surface? And for that we need uh, two things. We need its initial Ke and we need the potential energy rather than potential at this point. So it is the fact that gravitational potential GMM over R, so potential energy, is the same as the kinetic energy or the initial kinetic energy of the part uh, of the meteorite. So GMM over R is a half mv squared. Now, obviously, uh, potential energy is always negative, but we don't need to uh, deal with the negative um, part of the problem because we're, we're only dealing with the amount of potential energy changing into kinetic energy. And so we need to just rearrange this so that gives us. Uh, 2g uh, gm over r equals v squared. So the square root of 2gm over r equals v. And we substitute in our, our, our number. So g, gravitational field constant, that's in the constants bit. Mass is 7.4 times 10 uh, to the 22. So we've got the square root of uh, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Uh, times 2 times 7.4 times 10 to the 22 all over the root diameter. Now this is the diameter not the radius so I've got half of 3.5 times 10 to the 3 kilograms so I need to times that by 10 to the 3 sorry kilometers to get 
Uh, I need to times it by 10 to the 3 to get meters, and I'm square rooting that entire thing. When I type that into the calculator, it gives me 2.4 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. Just checking significant figures, 2, 2, 2 seems a reasonable amount. Okay. Uh, so, year 13, question 2. A U tube contains liquid, as shown in figure 3.1. Uh, the total length of the column in the liquid is uh, in the tube is L. The column of liquid is then displaced so that the change in height of the liquid in each arm of the U tube is X, as shown in Figure 3.2. Okay, so the question immediately tells you that it oscillates with simple harmonic motions. That's a big clue uh, as to the equations that you're going to use, such that the acceleration of uh, the column is given by the expression A is minus 2G over L X. Um, a big issue that we had to start with here for a number of students is that they got the basic simple harmonic motion equation wrong. Um, so we know that A is minus omega squared x for simple harmonic motion, but lots of students wrote A is minus omega x and forgot the squared. So that was a bit of a problem. So that means that we know uh, that omega squared in this case must be equal to 2g over L. Uh, and we had some trouble there where people were calling that omega. So I know that before I even look at the rest of the question. And actually, that ends up being the first mark point of the next uh, part of the question. So it asks you to calculate the period T of the oscillation of the liquid column uh, for a column length of length, uh, length L of 19 centimetres. Sorry, uh, mumbling my words there a little bit. OK, so we already know that omega squared is 2G over L. Uh, where we've identified that from the acceleration equation. So that obviously gives us something we need for L. Now, we also need another equation for another mark. So T is obviously 2 pi over omega. That gets me one mark. Omega squared being 2G over L also gives me one mark. I know then that T is equal to 2 pi over the square root of 2g over L, um, which is 2 pi over the square root of 2 times 9.81 over 0.19, gives me a value of 0.618 seconds. I've allowed that, but obviously if you look at significant figures in the question, you should be writing 0.62 seconds, and that is also worth one mark. Uh, that was generally done pretty well by everybody, actually. Now, in part B, uh, we definitely lost a few marks collectively as a year group. So, let's have a little look. We've got a graph that shows you the variation of displacement against time. Um, it's particularly for a liquid column of mass 18 grams. It says the oscillations are damped. Suggest one cause of the damping. Lots of people wrote friction, which isn't wrong, but it's not enough information. You would need to say where the friction is occurring between which objects to get that mark. So lots of you might have lost a mark there just through not putting enough detail. So there were four options. Uh, so you could have said, um, oh, that's no good, sorry. Let's try a different color pen. Uh, you could have said viscosity uh, of the liquid or you could have said viscous drag uh, or you could have said if you're referring to friction friction within the liquid itself or uh, friction well, I'm not going to put it in friction between the walls of the container uh, and the liquid for one mark, it wouldn't be enough to just say friction. Okay, oh goodness, right, let's get rid of that, sorry. Technologically terrible. Uh, okay, let's try a different colour. So, calculate the loss uh, in the total energy of the oscillations during the first 2.5 periods of the oscillations. Um, wasn't done too badly. Let me walk you through it. So, you got one mark for stating the correct equation. Now, you could either have written in terms of velocity rather than angular velocity, um, 
which would have been fine. So you could have said Ke is a half mv squared, but you also therefore needed to say that v is equal to omega x in that case. Or you could have jumped straight to saying a half m omega squared x naught squared. Okay, just from this bit here, just popping that into the equation. So, if you wrote either of those, that got you one mark. Obviously, you're looking for a change in kinetic energy, so therefore I'm going to look at a half m omega squared x naught squared minus, I'm going to call it x1 squared, oh, that should be inside, sorry. Uh, that would also then have got you one along with putting the numbers in. Now, we also had a bit of trouble where people didn't spot that this was in centimetres, so put the wrong power of 10. So I should have the change, I'm going to switch to a different colour so you can see, is a half um, omega squared. Uh, and if you read carefully, x naught is 2 times 10 to the minus 2 centimetres squared. Let me put a square bracket around that. Minus 0.95 times 10 to the minus 2 all squared. Uh, so that then gets you your second mark and then your third mark therefore comes from the answer which is 2.9 times 10 to the minus 4 joules gives you your third mark. Uh, I should say, sorry, I've kind of missed a step here. M is 18 times 10 to the minus 3 because uh, it tells you it's 18 grams. Uh, what else have I not subbed in? Uh, omega. So you can use your omega from a previous part of the question. Uh, let's see, where am I going to put this? Put it up at the side here. So we've got uh, omega is 2 pi over t, which is 2 pi over 0 0.62 gives me 10.13 radians per second. Um, you could also have worked out the initial velocity. Lots of people did this in different ways, so I just want to make sure I've covered everything. Uh, is x naught omega? So that's 2 times 10 to the minus 2 multiplied by 10.13 gives me 0.2 meters per second. So those were also things that you may have calculated. Sorry, a bit jumpy there. Okay, here we have uh, question 3, A part I. Now I'm not going to spend too much on the first bit, it's just the definition. Very similar to the first question in the exam about gravitational potential. Work done per unit charge to bring a positive charge from infinity to a point. So one mark for it is per unit charge because we're talking about potential. If they said potential energy, it would just be per unit. Uh, it wouldn't be per unit charge, it would be work done bringing a positive charge from infinity to a point. Uh, the positive has to be defined as well because that's just the nature of the definition. Second part for two marks, state the relationship between electric potential and electric field strength at a point. So this one's quite an interesting one. A lot of people approach the question by writing down the two equations and seeing what you had to divide one equation by the other to get the other equation. And that's not what they're asking here. The key bit is the relationship. So we want to know how the graphs relate to each other. And in that case... The electric field strength uh, is actually the negative gradient of the potential. Is the negative gradient of potential. Now you could write this in terms of differential, so you could say it's minus the uh, differential of the potential. Uh, you get one mark for saying gradient of potential and one mark for the minus sign. We must remember the minus sign. Part B then, we've got two parallel metal plates, a distance 1.2 centimetres apart. Now I've highlighted the centimetres here because it's very important in a second that uh, we, might, we might need it in terms of centimetres if we're going to convert stuff into metres, we'll see. And the potential between the two plates is minus 75 volts. So initially the helium nucleus is at rest on plate A where x is zero. So it's on there. The helium nucleus is free to move between the plates by considering energy changes of the helium nucleus. Explain why the speed at which it reaches plate B is independent of the separation of plates. So obviously a helium nucleus has two protons, so it wants to attract towards this negative potential over here. But the first thing I would say is that any gain in Ka, uh, Ke has to come about from a loss in 
uh, electric potential energy. So if I look at the gain in P, uh, Ke, it's going to be a half mv squared, and that's going to be the charge times the potential. When we look back at the definition here, potential is the work done by unit charge, so if I multiply it by the charge, it gives me potential energy. And as you can see with this equation, there is nothing about it that tells me about the distance between the plates. The only thing I'm interested in is the potential between the plates, which in this case is negative 75 volts. So for the final mark, I need to say that V is independent of uh, separation because I've just quoted it on this equation. There's nothing there with distance between the plates. And we will be using this again in a second. So as the helium nucleus at 4 to HE moves from plate A towards plate B, its distance X from plate A increases. Calculate the speed of the nucleus after it's moved a distance of 0.4 centimeters. So if I got all the way to plate B, I would have gone through a potential of 75 volts, or negative 75 volts. And because we've got a uniform field, uh, there is, uh, we, can, we can say, right, well, if I go only half the distance, I'll go through half the potential. So I want to know the fraction of the entire uh, distance between the plates that I've gone through. And in order to do that, I need to do 0.4, which is the distance I've traveled, divided by 1.2, which is the total distance. So I've traveled a third of the distance towards plate B, which means I would have got a third of the way through the potential. So a third of 75 volts, negative 25 volts. The minus sign doesn't really matter for our calculations. So the potential at the point 0.4 centimeters away from the plate is 25 volts. And now we can stick that back into here to find V. So let's rearrange this equation. I've got a half mv squared equals q times the potential. So v equals 2qv over m square rooted. And let's just stub in the numbers. So we've got the square root of 2. Well, the charge on the helium nucleus, this is another area where we need to be careful. We've got two protons. So it's two lots of the charge on a proton, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Make sure that looks like a 19 times our potential we've just calculated, which is 25, divided by the mass of the helium nucleus, which is four nucleons. We have to look up the mass of one nucleon, which is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27. And when we type that in our calculator, let's just take a look at the significant figures here. I've got two significant figures, uh, two significant figures with a potential. So I'm going to go two significant figures for the answer here which is 4.9 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. And that is the final answer. Okay, for year 13, question 4a, it says explain what is meant by a magnetic field. So there's two key parts to this. One that is the same for all fields, but one that is also specific to magnetic fields. So any field is a region where there is a force, but a magnetic field is a region where a moving charge or a permanent magnet or a current carrying conductor That conductor experiences a force. For part B, uh, there was a pr problem with the printing on a number of the papers. Um, however, we've been a little bit lenient with the marking on this. Um, and so long as you've got a circular like deflection within the region, as it should be, um, and then a straight section, we have been quite flexible. If you would like me to explain, if you didn't get three out of three marks for this section, um, I will explain the justification for that if you um, pop by and see me. But essentially what we've got is a particle with a mass and a charge and a speed V entering into a uniform um, magnetic field of flux density B such that on entry um, it's moving normal to the magnetic field as shown. So it's going in this way. Um, 
Now, if it's a positive charge, moving to the right, we can use our left hand rule um, and it tell, to find the direction of the force. It tells us at the bottom here that the direction of the magnetic field is perpendicular to and into the plane of the paper. So the field in this shaded region is going into the page, so inside this shaded region. Using the left-hand rule, that's going to cause a deflection of the particle going upwards initially. Now, because the angle at which the particle is moving through the field is changing because of that accelerating force, um, the force is acting as a centripetal force. And so what you should get is a circular, let me rub that bit out a little bit so it's a bit clearer, a circular uh, deflection here about this radius r. Once it then exits the field, so from here it should then go in a straight line um, continuously. So it needs to be a single clear path um, going upwards and it needs to be circular by I um, for the region inside the field. For part two, it says it's, there is a force acting on the particle causing it to accelerate. Um, explain why the speed of the particle on leaving the field is V. So the force that acts on the particle is perpendicular to, so this force is perpendicular to the velocity. Um, what that means is it's not going to change the speed of the velocity, it's only going to change the direction. Um, and so the reason for that, explaining why, is that the force is perpendicular to velocity. Okay, so the force isn't going to cause that velocity change, that speed or the, the magnitude of that velocity to change, only the direction. Now for part C, um, it says the particle in B loses an electron so that the charge becomes 2Q. The change in mass is negligible. So determine in terms of V, the initial speed of the particle so its path through the magnetic field is unchanged. Explain your working. So because the magnetic force provides the centripetal force um, and that's why it's circular in this part of the question um, we can say that BQV is equal to MV squared over R now we want R to be constant okay um, and so for R, if we rearrange this, we get R is equal to MV over BQ. So the mass is unchanged, the field strength is unchanged, so R is proportional to V over Q. Now, if we've got 2Q, we also need to have 2V um, to keep that ratio the same. So the speed initially must be 2 V. Okay, that's it for question eight. Okay, question five. A particle has mass m and charge q and is travelling with speed v through a vacuum. The initial direction of travel is parallel to the plane of two charged horizontal metal plates as shown in figure 6.1. Okay, so looking at this I can see that this is earth, so this is at zero volts, so therefore the direction of the electric field is going to be this way before I even start and therefore Fe on a positive charge is going to be down. I know that I have plus Q with mass M so therefore that force is going to act down on it. Uh, I also am told the value of the electric field is 2.8 times 10 to the 4 uh, volt meters, uh, volts per meter. Sorry. Okay, I know that E is equal to V over D 
and it's also equal to f over q. Okay, the first part was not explained particularly well by the vast majority of students. So, the question asks uh, why the path of the particle in the electric field is not an arc of a circle. Now, the thing that people missed uh, was that for circular motion, the force on the particle must also always be at 90 degrees to the direction of motion. Now, when the uh, particle enters the plate, obviously it's travelling horizontally, and so the force is at 90 degrees. So, initially, the conditions are that it could start, uh, be in circular motion. But the problem is, that force then... Uh, uh, sorry, words, goodness me. Uh, it, the force makes the particle deviate out of its path so that the angle between the force and the direction of motion is no longer 90 degrees. Um, and so therefore, you don't have a condition for circular motion. So what you really needed to say is uh, for circular motion, the force um, on the particle should act at 90 degrees uh, to the motion at all times. But while the uh, particle direction changes, the force direction actually remains constant due to the electric field. And so not the whole time do you have a condition for circular motion, so you're not going to get an arc of a circle. Um, and that's the point that a lot of students missed. So, in part B, a uniform magnetic field is now formed in the region between the metal plates, in addition to the original electric field. Uh, it's adjusted so that the positively charged particle passes undeviated between the plates. So that means it's not changing, uh, and so it will remain in a horizontal path. Now, you know that without the magnetic field, it deviates down, and you know that you have F be acting down on a positive charged particle plus Q. So therefore, there must be an equal and opposite force from the magnetic field uh, so that it counteracts the force from the electric field to keep it undeviated. Okay, And then you just use the left-hand rule in order to get your uh, magnetic field. Now, people just immediately jumped to talking about the left-hand rule and didn't talk about the fact that they knew that it had to be equal and opposite, and that's why they then lost marks. So, state, so say, so that bit was fine, most people got that mark. Um, so, the field uh, must be into the page. Uh, so, you could even say due to the left-hand rule, and that would get you one. That's the stating, but the explaining bit comes from saying that the force due to the magnetic field must be uh, in the opposite direction to the force from the electric field. And that's the bit that uh, people tripped up on a little bit. So then it says the particle has speed 4.7 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Calculate the magnitude of the flux density. Explain your working. So one mark comes from stating that you know the force due to the magnetic field is BQB and the force due to the electric field is QE. And if they're equal and opposite, you can equate them. So, sorry, that's one mark there. So equating them, BQV is equal to QE. Obviously, the Qs then cancel and B is equal to E over V. Uh, you are told E in a previous part of the question, which is 2.8 times 10 to the, is it 4? Yes, it's 4. Um, and you also are then told in this part of the question that the speed is 4.7 times 10 to the 5. So that then gives you a value of 6 times 10 to the minus 2 Tesla. So one mark for equating them, one mark for this derivation and one mark for this answer. That bit was generally fine for everybody. Uh, part C, we didn't do so well. <laughs> so the particle in B has mass m, charge plus q, and speed v. So that was what we were originally looking at. 
So without any further calculation, state the effect, if any, on the path of a particle that still has charge mass m, so the mass isn't affecting it, still has speed v, that's not changed, but the charge is now negative. Okay, now the force due to the electric field is the force that will act on a positive charge. So if I now have a negative charge, I know that Fe flips and changes direction because I have a negative charge. But also, Fb also flips. Okay, so the net effect, that's no change. Okay, so the direction of the force for both flips, but together that's no change. Now, we also know... Uh, in this next one that the mass and the charge remain the same but now we have a speed of 2v so we need to look at the impact that speed has so we have or velocity uh, fe is obviously qe so it's not reliant on on speed so therefore that's unchanged but fb is bqv so therefore the force doubles and it's in an upwards direction so therefore it deviates upwards because now you have twice the size of the force up uh, than previously. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now. Okay, question six on the year 13 paper. State what is meant by radioactive decay. A uh, recall question here. There's three things they're looking for in your definition and you need to see it's three marks and there's one, two, three, four lines being given to you. Some people wrote literally one line on this, which isn't going to give you three marks. So think of as much as you can, which could go towards this, okay? So, what is meant by radioactive decay? So first things they were looking for, mark one was that there is an unstable nucleus, okay? Okay, so they're looking for unstable nucleus. Number two, okay, the idea that there's some kind of emission okay of i think lots of people wrote alpha beta and gamma radiation okay but they want um anything that would be fine any kind of idea there's particles or photons that are emitted okay and the um, the third idea is that this emission is spontaneous okay which means we cannot predict or it's not influenced by external factors we can't make it happen Okay, spontaneous, there's a mission of particles, and there's an unstable nucleus. Okay, things you could have also written, so it's random. Okay, they also gave this idea that it released ionizing particles and photons. Okay, but those were the three main points you were looking, they were looking for you to get across. Okay, on to the next part. We've got a, a graph, which is variation of time for number of undecayed nuclei in a sample of radioactive isotopes. So here we've got number of radioactive nuclei. Something you need to pay attention to is the units is 10 to the power of 10, okay? And on this one, the units is in hours, okay? Use the gradient of the lines. They say, tell me, use the gradient to find the activity of the sample at T equals 4 hours. Show my working. Okay, so at T equals 4 hours, that is at this point here. To find the gradient of a curved line, you know you need to take the tangent of that line, okay? So this isn't going to look very good because I'm doing it on the laptop, okay? That line should obviously be alongside this one, okay? I'm going to take, draw the tangent along that, okay? And then I'm going to do a nice big triangle and use that to find the gradient. So you need to show you're working for that. So there's one mark for a tangent drawn, tangent uh, drawn and gradient calculation attempted. Okay, you should have got about 1.3 times 10 to the four uh, becquerels. Okay, however, there was a bit of a range. Okay, if you were within 0.1 of that. Okay, so if you were between uh, 1.2 to 1.4 times 10 to the four, you would have got. Um, you would have got uh, all the marks, okay? If you were between 1.1 to 1.5, you would have got um, some of the marks, okay? So do make sure you converted Becquerel's is in number of decays per second, 
okay so you would have had to have turned your hours into seconds so that would have been um, whatever you got for your number of your x you would need to times by um, 3600 okay to put it into hours so do make sure you pay attention to that okay then it says use your answer to show the decay constant of the isotope is approximately 4 times 10 to the minus 5. This was a little bit tricky if you hadn't done the previous part because you needed to use your answer and you needed to show that a specific number. Um, but you could have always got a mark just for doing the equation, writing down the equation that relates activity and decay constant. So you should have known that activity is the decay constant times by the number of nuclei. And that makes sense. Because the decay constant is the probability of a nucleus decaying. And if you multiply that by the number of nucleuses, then you'll get how many are decaying each second. Okay, so then you're just going to rearrange this and you're going to do um, the uh, decay constant approximately that. So you're going to take your activity, which you at that point, which was 1.3 times 10 to the 4, okay, and then you're going to divide that by the um, uh, nucleus. I've just realized that all of these should have been 10 to the 6. I do apologize for all of those. Sorry. That should have been 10 to the 6. Okay. Um, so if that's 10 to the 6, then you're going to divide by the number of nuclei at that point. Well, the number of nuclei at that point, 4. Well, I'm reading off here, it's halfway between 3 and 3.1. So the number of nuclei is, whoops, the pen's being a bit weird, 3.05, okay, times 10 to the 10. Okay, remembering that it's 10 to the power of 10. Okay, if you do that, you will get uh, 4.3 times 10 to the minus 5, which is approximately what they're asking for. Okay? Um, remember, it's on a show that question, you must always write down an equation. Okay, and I'll show that. Okay, moving on to the next part then. So three marks, and this one was answered quite well. Okay, so um, a sample of a different radioactive isotope. So it's different, has an initial activity of this. It must be stored safely until its activity is reduced to this activity. Okay, the decay constant is this. Calculate the minimum time in days which the sample must be stored. Okay, so here, we're going to be using the equation for how activity changes over time, which is our exponential decay, okay? Just like the number of nuclei decaying over time, which is this equation here. We now are trying to find the time. So it's going to be a rearranging this for um, time, okay? Um, I'm going to, uh, you could rearrange it first or you could put in the numbers first. It wouldn't actually matter. Okay, so if I was going to rearrange this for time, I can see I'm going to have a divided by a naught equals e to the minus lambda t. Then I'm going to um, uh, natural log both sides. Okay, that's going to give me log of a over a naught equals minus lambda t because the log and the um, e will cancel out. Okay, and then I'm going to rearrange that. I'm going to get t is minus... 1 over lambda times natural log of a over a naught. Okay, then I'm going to substitute in. Okay, this is my a naught. This is the activity I'm heading towards. The decay constant is here. If you substitute all that in, you will get roughly 32 days. Okay, and that's that question finished. Okay, you're 13, question 7. Uh, you've got a question about the kinetic theory of gases based on some simple assumptions. Uh, so we definitely learnt those um, kind of as facts, recall facts. Uh, so that's just a simple bit of revision for this one. So it asks you to state the assumption of uh, ideal gas molecules based on them, the nature of their movement. So movement's the key here. Uh, sorry, let me get my pen. Um, so some students were writing assumptions that were absolutely true, uh, but they weren't about movement, so they didn't get the mark. So if you're talking about uh, elastic collisions, 
it's a valid assumption that we have about the theory of gases, kinetic theory of gases, but it's not what we need given that we're asked about the nature of their movement. So you could have had either random movement or random motion would get you one mark, or you could have said constant velocity. Uh, sorry, can't spell today. So that's quite straightforward. The next one was done pretty well, actually. So um, an assumption about their volume. So you just need to say that the volume of uh, the molecules is negligible or are negligible compared to the volume of their container. So that's two marks, obviously. So if you said that, the first mark would have been come from saying this bit, uh, that the uh, volume of the molecule is negligible, and the second, obviously, comparing that to the container volume. You could actually also have said that the radius or diameter of the molecule is negligible compared to the average intermolecular forces, um, but all students went with uh, the one that I've just written down, um, so obviously that's the one that's stuck in everyone's mind. Okay. Part B, sorry, it's very jumpy. A cube of volume V contains N molecules of an ideal gas. Each molecule has a component Cx of velocity normal to one side S of the cube, as shown in figure 2.1. The pressure P of the gas due to the component Cx of the velocity is given by PV is equal to NMCx squared. Now, Mr. Presswich and I had a discussion about this because it was quite a tricky one to mark, um, and we both... Uh, discussed that the way we approach teaching you this question um, has led the vast majority of students to basically recall the derivation that we did in class, which is a valid derivation, but it doesn't answer the particular question. So potentially we should have been more explicit about uh, saying to you, actually you need to look really carefully um, at the question that you're given and does your uh, general derivation actually answer the question. Now, we never explicitly put CX into our derivations that we did in lessons. Um, so that's why this mark scheme <laughs> has unfortunately meant that lots of you haven't got marks, even though your physics is good. So I'll try and break it down as slowly as I can. Now, we can see that PV equals NMCX squared is looking only at collisions occurring in the X plane. And the first mark comes from uh, describing that molecules actually have uh, velocity components in three directions. Uh, so obviously x, y, and z. Uh, so Overall, if I look at average speed or speed squared, I can say that Cx squared plus Cy squared plus Cz squared, so that the overall uh, speed squared uh, takes into uh, consideration the movement in all directions. And so identifying that actually there are velocity components in three planes gets you one mark, and that's an M mark. So obviously that means that there's going to be an A mark that if you didn't say what I've just written, but you did write the A mark, you're not going to get that, unfortunately. The second point comes from realising that the mean, so the average square speed in each direction, will be the same. So instead of writing that as a sentence... I could have said this, so writing as a symbol. So mean square speed x will also be y. That's a z, sorry, not a t. So that statement will also get me a mark. And then the third mark comes from saying, OK, if I know that um, c squared is Cx squared plus Cy squared plus Cz squared. Mean square speed overall must be equal to 
the, uh, I've already written that bit, sorry, must be equal to, um, sorry, had a bit of a mind blank there. Hopefully I can bring that back so that Mr. Wright doesn't have to edit that out. Uh, so we know that the mean square speed uh, must be equal to the sum of all of these, but that they are equal to each other. So therefore I can write 3CX for mean spe uh, square speed in the x direction. So hopefully that logically makes sense how I've got from this step to this step. Um, I know that I have to add the uh, square speeds in x, y, and z to get the total square speed. And I know that x, y, and z mean square speeds are the same value. So I'm just going to say that that's 3 of c x squared. And then obviously I can say therefore that mean square speed in the x plane must be equal to a third of the mean square speed overall. And then if I look back at my first equation, PV is nmcx squared, uh, I know that I can just sub in a third c mean squ uh, square speed, so a third c squared. So this bit is this bit. So therefore, PV is a third nm c squared. Uh, so this bit down here, this last line, also gets you, that's your A mark, A1. Uh, so unfortunately, lots of people didn't get those marks because they didn't really link it to the initial equation that I've uh, circled in green. They've jumped straight to the derivation that they learned in class. So that was a bit of a tricky one and a really mean question, I think. Um, so don't beat yourself up too much if that didn't go so well. Okay, last part of the question then. Uh, so the molecules of an ideal gas have a root mean square speed of 520 metres per second um, at a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. Now this should immediately be raising a flag and you should be writing that that's 300 Kelvin. Um, and then this 100 is obviously... 373. Now lots of people didn't get marks because they left things in degrees Celsius. So if I take what's written here and I write that um, as a simple expression, I can say this. So I can say mean square speed is proportional to t. The square root of the mean square speed is therefore proportional to the square root of t, the temperature. It asks you to calculate the root mean square speed, so that's this, okay, of the molecules at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius or 373 Kelvin. So I can use my proportionality knowing that this is a root mean square value here, so I can say 520 is proportional to the square root of 300. And my unknown, so my root mean squared that I'm not sure of, must be proportional to the square root of 373. So I also therefore know, sorry, I'm just going to come all the way down here and say 520 over the square root of 300 must be equal to the unknown value over the square root of 373. Okay, uh, so that's just using proportionality. So if you're not sure about that, it's probably a good time to have a little look over there. Now that tells me then that 520 over root 300 multiply all of that by root 373 will give me 579.8. Um, give that to the correct number of significant figures. That gives me 580 meters per second. So you get one mark up here for identifying your proportionality statements, one mark for this line here, and then one mark for my final answer. Uh, that wasn't done terribly in terms of the maths, but just because people are forgetting to convert to Kelvin, uh, they ended up losing quite a lot of marks. Okay, question eight. Uh, define specific latent heat. So this is just a recall from your definitions. Um, there was an M mark 
which meant that some people got zero. So you just needed to say, oh, come on, let's draw, that it's the amount uh, of energy required to change the state, not the temperature, <laughs> as some people said, uh, of a unit mass, that bit was required, uh, of a substance, that's one, without a change in temperature. And that was there the second mark. Uh, so people often miss the unit mass which led them to these marks, but that's just a basic definition. Uh, so the heater in an electric kettle has a power of 2.4 kilowatts. Uh, you're told that uh, boiling occurs at a steady rate for two minutes. I'd immediately be writing 120 seconds next to that. Uh, it does say 106 grams. See how you're good at trying to catch you out like this because you might want to convert to kilograms immediately, but actually it then gives you the latent heat value in joules per kilogram. So I would be leaving that. So you you know, therefore, that there's uh, energy input um, being used to change the state, but that there's also heat loss to the surroundings. So I'm going to label the rate of loss of thermal energy as H, okay? Uh, so that's obviously going to be a power, okay? Because it's a rate of loss of energy, so it's energy over time. So H is a power value measured in watts. So if I look at my normal equation for latent heat, it's Q is equal to ML, but in this case, if I consider Q to be the total energy in, that's also going to be equal to the energy loss due to the um, heat loss to the surroundings. So that's HT. Um, and I can also say then that power is ML over T plus H. And because you're asked for the rate of the loss, you're actually going to use this equation here. Let me change my pen, it doesn't want to let me. Okay, uh, so therefore, because I know the power, I have 2.4 times 10 to the 3, because that's in kilowatts, must be equal to the mass, which is 106, multiplied by L, which is 2260, and that all occurs in a time of 120 seconds, and that is going to be plus H. Okay, pop that into your calculator, and you'll get... 403.7 watts. Uh, CIE have allowed you to put that into 400 watts for significant figures. So um, you get one for this identification, one for this step of working, and one here. Okay, question number nine on the year 13 structured paper. This is a simple harmonic question, as we can see from the graph here. Um, we can see a ball is uh, moved a uh, small distance to the side then released the variation of distance with time is there simple harmonic so use the data from 4.2 okay i'm going to need to use that graph to determine the horizontal acceleration of the ball for a displacement of x at two um, centimeters well i know the equation for acceleration a is minus omega squared x okay so do I know either of those? Well, they've told me x is 2.0. So I know this already is 2.0. I don't know omega. So I'm going to have to use the graph. And I can see from the graph, well, on the graph, I can calculate the time period. And I know that you can get from time period to omega because omega equals 2 pi over t. Okay, so there's one mark for putting both those equations down. So next thing is figuring out the time period. Well, I'm going to look at where two peaks are, and I can see there's a peak here, and there's a peak here. And the distance between them is 0 0.6. So the time period is 0 0.6 seconds, and there's a mark for that as well. Now I can substitute in everything I know and answer this. So A equals minus... 2 pi over 0 0.6 all squared 
times, and now I've got to be careful, that 2 is 2 centimetres, so that's 0 0.02 metres, okay? So if I put all of that into there, I will get uh, 2.2 metres per second squared, okay? Um, I could put minus, I could, but they'll give me the mark either way. This part B was a trickier question, okay? We needed to draw a graph of how the kinetic energy of the ball varies, okay? Um, just a sketch, I don't need um, any numbers, okay? Apart from, obviously, they've given me the time period, so that time period should match up for the first one second of its motion. So things I'm thinking about here, kinetic energy is always positive. They've told me the maximum kinetic energy is EK. So I know it's going to vary between zero and EK. Okay. Next thing is thinking about what shape um, it will make. Okay, and this is where lots of people went wrong. So I'm thinking EK, okay, well kinetic energy, okay, is a half mv squared. I know that the velocity of a um, of a simple harmonic motion is a sine sinusoidal shape. I know the velocity will be doing this. Okay, so my ek will be a sine squared graph. Okay, and a sine squared graph. Okay is still a sinusoidal shape. It still has this general shape, okay? Apart from, it's always positive, okay? So it's going to be um, varying um, always above the x-axis. The time period will be different for a sine squared graph, though. It will be different, okay? It's gonna be a sinusoidal shape, so there's one mark for it being sinusoidal, and there's one mark for it always being positive and the peaks being at EK, everything we've mentioned. The third mark is for the time period being correct. And I've got to think here, what is the time period of this going to be? Well, the velocity, okay, varies between zero and a maximum and back to zero and then a negative maximum and then zero again in one time period, okay? That's in one normal time period. So that would normally take 0 0.6 seconds. But here we're doing V squared, and V squared doesn't care whether it's positive or not, okay? So what's gonna happen is, is my time period is gonna be identical, okay, between here and here and here and here, okay? So actually, what this is going to have is it's going to have a time period of 0 0.3 seconds, okay? Because the velocity has a sine shape here, okay? And that's going to increase quicker, and that's going to, um, as it decreases, my uh, electric energy is also going to decrease, okay? And I know that the kinetic energy is 0 when the velocity is 0. So I can actually mark those points on. I know here it's 0, I know um, when the velocity is zero, it'll be zero as uh, well. So I know in one time period, it will be zero at um, 0 0.3, which is here, okay? And um, I know at 0 0.6, it will also be zero, okay? So, and I know it'll be at its maximum halfway between that, which is going to be um, 1.5, which is here. And I know it'll be at its maximum halfway between uh, 0 0.3 and that, which is 0 0.45, which is here. Okay, so I've got these points I can actually plot on my graph um, now. Um, and I can see that going to go up, it's going to do that, it's going to go up, it's going to do that, okay, and then obviously that's going to continue onwards, 
and we can see it's a, my drawing's obviously not great. This will be 0 0.75 here. This will be 0 0.9 here. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. Okay. So the key things when you're answering this is obviously I've done a load of detail here about why it's assigned your soil shape. Okay. The key thing for you is just plotting on some points. So you know it's going to be zero when the velocity is zero. You know it's going to be ek max when the velocity is max. Okay. You know the velocity is max when the um, distance here is zero. Okay. And you know the velocity is zero when its distance is at a maximum. Okay. So I know it's going to do this general shape. Okay. And you can see here. Well, my time period in this case, well, between two peaks here and here, is now only 0 0.3 seconds rather than 0 0.6. So your graph should have looked something like that to get the three points. Okay, that is that question finished. So question 10 was all about rectifying voltages, something that we've seen quite a lot before. Uh, and remember, uh, for these kind of rectification questions, you may see uh, references from other syllabuses to uh, CR values, things like time constants, but for CIE it's not relevant. Um, so just looking at the circuit we can see here, um, you should recognize uh, that this part um, uh, will do full wave rectification. And we should then recognize that this part, the, co the combination of a capacitor and a resistor will give a smoothed output. And indeed, um, when we look at uh, the graph of voltage again through the res across the resistor, we can see that that is what's going on. Um, so the first thing you're asked to find is the peak voltage, which is an absolute gift. You can see the peak voltage is right there. So the peak voltage is 4.0 volts. Uh, it is important to have a uh, two sig fig in there. Uh, because you can see that uh, one small square uh, will be worth uh, 0 0.4. So we can roughly say that, 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 that there's, there's not just one significant figure. Then asked to find the root mean square, or RMS. Again, pretty much a gift. We just need to remember that RMS voltage is equal to the uh, peak voltage, I thought VP, over root 2. Uh, so that becomes 4.0 divided by the square root of 2, uh, which comes out at 2.8 volts. Um, always check the, those things. Um, when I was doing my A-levels, I found it really difficult to remember if I was supposed to multiply by root 2 or divide by root 2. Um, just remember that obviously the RMS value is always going to be lower, so just check your working. If you end up with something that's higher, you could done the, you've done it the wrong way. Part three, you're asked to find the frequency showing your working. Now, what's important to remember here is that this is rectified. So the unrectified uh, portion would look something like this. So the time period is actually this whole length. It's from there to there, uh, which is 20 milliseconds. Quite a lot of you got half of that um, because you measured this distance rather than a full cycle so do be careful with that um, so once you know that uh, then you can use the fact that uh, frequency is 1 over time period which means it's 1 over 20 milliseconds so that's 20 times 10 to the negative 3 um, and that comes out as 50 and the uh, units are already there 50 hertz you're then told that the capacitor has a capacitance of 0 .5, sorry, 5.0 microfarads, and you're asked for a single discharge of the capacitor through resistor R, use figure 6.2 to determine the change in potential difference. So this is figure 6.2. So it's saying that during a single discharge, so that would mean as the capacitor, uh, it will be charged up uh, just look at this there. So current will go that way. So it will charge like this. And then it will discharge that way. Not really relevant, but I just think it's interesting to note. 
um, and you're asked for the change in voltage. Um, so that's pretty simple. All I need to do is say, well, what then is this change? What's the change there? So when I look along here, I can see that that minimum value, uh, that is 2.4 volts. So I can say, therefore, that the change in voltage, so I'm going to put delta V because I like to use Greek letters and it makes me look intelligent. Delta V is my initial value of 4 volts, take away my final value of 2.4 volts, uh, which comes out at uh, 1.6 volts. It was really bizarre marking these. So many of you made arithmetic errors on that one. Look, don't be proud guys. Just use a calculator. Check. Obviously you should be able to do this um, by using your knowledge and intelligence but there's no shame in checking it on a calculator as well. You're then asked to determine the change in charge on each plate of the capacitor. Um, and this is where some of you, I think, got a bit confused. Some of you tried to do things like doubling it because you are, or halving it because you're asked for each plate on a capacitor. Um, so it's important to remember that the total charge on any capacitor is always zero because one plate becomes positively charged and one plate becomes negatively charged. And often people forget that as they get more into their physics. They just sort of edit that out of their brain. Um, so it's important to remember um, when you are doing these kinds of questions, um, all of the, the charge equations, um, for instance, uh, we are going to use the equation here that the charge on a plate of the capacitor is uh, capacitance times voltage. Um, you, you need to remember that uh, that charge is on a single plate because it will be the opposite charge on the other plate. Anyway, I've written down this equation here, Q is CV. Um, a, a possibly more accurate way of writing is delta Q is C times delta V, because I can actually uh, calculate this through a change in charge and a change in voltage. And once I've done that, uh, you can see that I've got everything that I need to know. Uh, my, Therefore, I'm asked to write delta charge, so I can say change in charge is that capacitance, which was 5.0, and it's micro, so 10 to the negative 6. Uh, and I'm multiplying that by my uh, voltage change, which is 1.6. And when I plug all that in, uh, sorry, uh, which is 1.6. And when I plug all that in, I get uh, 8.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. Part 3, you are asked to find the average current in the resistor. Um, or to show that it's this number. Um, so to find an average current, we are going to use the fact that uh, change in charge is equal to I times time period. Um, so we can just say that average current is rate of change of charge. So I already know uh, that my uh, change in charge is 8.0 times 10 to the negative 6. So I just need to find the time taken for a discharge. So looking up here, I can say that this section is the discharge. So I need to know how long that period takes. Um, and when you read it across, that is seven milliseconds. Uh, so then it becomes pretty easy just to do divided by seven times 10 to the negative three, because remember it is in milliseconds. Um, and that comes out as uh, 1.14 times 10 to the negative 3 amps, which is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 3 amps. So we've shown that equation. Um, the last one asking, is asking you to estimate the resistance of resistor R. Now, if you, again, this is where it can be confusing. If you look at other examples, uh, they would have methods that uh, used different uh, equations to do that. But for CIE, um, it got a little bit weird and hand-wavy. Um, and it, it caused a little bit of an uh, argument in the science office uh, when we discussed it and we looked to and we, and we thought about it. Um, because the only equation that you can use is Ohm's law. So we can say V is equal 
to IR. Um, and then what we can say is, well, what is the, the, this V here will be the average voltage. Now, from a graph like this and from the maths that you know, there's no way of actually calculating the average voltage. Um, but what you could do is, by inspection, say that V average is approximately halfway between the two. Um, so it would be a, a half of uh, V1 plus V2, if I call this V1 and I call that V2. So basically it's kind of that middle value. Um, so when you plug that in, um, you would get V average uh, is 3.2 volts. Now, lots of you missed out on that mark, and to be honest, I can totally understand why, because I, um, I'm i not completely happy with uh, the, the logic and reasoning behind there, but I suppose it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good argument here that if you're stuck, think of a number that could work, um, and, av and the average of the two is, is I suppose, a, a reasonable guess to try, um, because you do get something of a reasonable answer there. Um, so we're going to say uh, average is that. Uh, so that would be resistance with V over I. So that would be 3.2 divided by our previously calculated uh, current, which is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 3 amps. Uh, so that comes to uh, 2,900 ohms. Very few people got that mark. And to be honest, I can understand why. For year 13, question 11, we are told that a spherical mass of planet, uh, a spherical planet has a mass m and a radius r. The planet may be assumed to be isolated in space and to have its mass concentrated at its centre. It spins on its axis with angular speed of omega, as illustrated in Figure 1.1. So we can see the diagram there. A small object of mass m rests on the equator of the planet. So that's this m here. And the surface of the planet exerts a normal force reaction to the mass. Okay, so there we know there is a force, a normal force here. So state formula in terms of M, capital M, M, lowercase m, R and omega 4, the gravitational force between the planet and the object. So these this first one, we've just got to remember our Newton's law of gravitation. So F equals G, big M, small m, over R squared. Now, just be careful. This wants a capital R. So you should have a capital R in your formula. For the second part, the centripetal force required for the circular motion of the small mass is F equals G, uh, sorry, F equals M, R, use capital R again and then omega squared. To find a normal force, we've got to think about the balancing of the forces. So if the gravitational force is acting towards the center of the Earth, the centripetal force is the gravitational force, so that is the centripetal force as well. Um, and so, in this case, the normal force is going to be the difference between them. Oh, I've lost the questioning. Okay. Um, the reason for that, if the gravitational was larger, then what would happen is the object would be pulled down in the surface. So, we know that there must be a force that is an additional going outwards um, to stop it from moving inwards. We know that the centripetal force is present because it is in orbit around the Earth. Um, and so what we are going to have to find is the difference between the centripetal and the gravitational. And that is going to be our reaction. So the reaction is equal to uh, our gravitational, gm m over r squared, minus our centripetal, m r omega squared. It says, explain why the normal reaction on the mass 
will have different values at the equator and at the poles. Now, it's a little bit confusing initially, but you, what you've got to consider is, at the moment it's on the equator. If we move the mass up, so it's higher up on the planet, then its orbit, its centripetal orbit radius, is decreasing. So as we get towards the poles, the value of R in m r omega squared is decreasing. Now, once it gets to the very top at the pole, it's going to decrease so that the r in r centripetal approaches zero. So r approaches zero at the poles. And so what that means um, is that the normal force um, will be slightly different because this value is going to decrease down to eventually zero if we are stood right on the pole because the R value is zero. For question 11, part 3, we are told that the radius of the planet is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. It completes one revolution in 8.6 times 10 to the 4 seconds and calculate the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. So we know that the acceleration is equal to the radius times by the 2 pi over f squared because it's r omega squared. So we can plug in our values for that, and what you should get is 0.034 for this acceleration. Now at the poles, we know that the centripetal acceleration, this r, goes to zero. So r omega squared is equal to zero. For the final section, it says state two factors that could, in the case of a real planet, cause variations in the acceleration of free fall at its surface. So most people got one mark out of the two of this, um, but essentially what is going to happen or what will need to change is the strength of perhaps the gravitational field at that point. So that will change. So GM m over r squared, that will change if the radius of the planet varies. So if there are mountains, if there are valleys, then the radius is going to be changing, or even if um, it changes such that the equator and the poles, um, the radius is going to vary. So if it's slightly elliptical of a planet rather than perfectly spherical. The other way that that could change is if the density is not constant. So if one side of the sphere has more uh, density or more higher regions of de higher density, then that will change the uh, force at this region compared to this region. Uh, if the planet is spinning in itself, that is going to mean that there is a greater centripetal um, acceleration which is going to change the acceleration of pre-fall um, or if there's planets nearby then you're going to end up with a slightly different resultant gravitational force on this so there's a few different options you can have for here the most obvious ones um, for me will be the radius varying and there's been planets nearby okay question 12 uh, the first part A was done really well by everybody. Uh, I don't think there was anyone that didn't get that mark, so I'm just going to breeze through that. So the uh, equation to represent the first law of thermodynamics in terms of Q uh, and W is just delta U equals Q plus W. Okay, so that's looking at the change um, in internal energy 
and where that occurs is it through heating or work done now that then led people to think about part b in a slightly wrong way i think it was a little bit kind of leading so it says the pressure of an ideal gas is decreased at constant temperature and then it says explain what change and i think the important bit is it says if any occurs in the internal energy of the gas so it might be that there isn't a change and so if i were you i wouldn't immediately look at this question I would actually look at uh, question sorry this equation i would actually look at the equation for what internal energy is so you know that u is the sum of the random distribution of the kin uh, kinetic and potential energies of the molecules and i would be looking at it in terms of that instead okay now i know that ke is proportional to t and t the temperature is unchanged so I would say Ke is constant because T is constant. And that's actually worth one mark for identifying that. Then you say, okay, the potential energy is constant uh, because the gas, because it is a gas, has no intermolecular forces, sorry that's over two lines, um, so therefore if Ke and Pe are constant, there is no change in internal energy. So you've got one mark for identifying that Ke was constant, one for Pe being constant and then one for coming to the correct uh, conclusion. Um, and the trouble is, because you all had written this equation here, you immediately jumped thinking about Q and W. Um, and that's where I think people went a little bit wrong, because I don't think anyone wouldn't have been able to um, kind of know the points that I've made. So if it says explain what change, if any, think about it in terms of the kinetic and potential energies first. And if you know they're constant, you don't even need to worry about the work done or the heating effect. All right, so the last question of your mock. You're given a solid sphere of, sorry, sorry, solid metal sphere of radius r insulated from its surroundings. And it has been given a charge of plus q. Uh, the charge on the surface of the sphere, but it may be considered the point charge at the centre as illustrated there, which remember one of the key principles that we've talked about. So the first thing that you are asked for is to define capacitance. Now the definition of that is it's a ratio, um, and it is the ratio of charge and you could say on an object, but it's easy enough just to say charge to potential. Now, it's really important not to start talking about potential on plates or anything like that. Um, there are generalized equations that will tell us the charge on a, on a parallel plate capacitor and that will tell us the charge on a sphere. But as you should remember, those are equations for specific cases. Um, the, the only sort of general um, equation we can say is that uh, capacitance is charge divided by voltage. Uh, so just, just be aware of uh, that, that we don't want to be talking about plates or anything else because that's wrong. Uh, that's a plates are a specific case. We want the general case for a question like this. You didn't ask to show that the capacitance C of the sphere itself is given by the equation C is 4 pi epsilon naught r. So we're going to do that. Um, by knowing, first of all, um, that uh, the potential on a sphere is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R. Um, and we also need to know from what I just said a minute ago that capacitance is charge divided by voltage. Uh, so to substitute uh, the two together, I can say that... Uh, V is that, so C will be Q divided by Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R, which becomes 4 pi epsilon naught R. 
The sphere has a radius of 36 centimeters. Let's uh, straight away rewrite that as 0 0.36 meters. So we're not tempted to accidentally use it in uh, the wrong units in an equation. Then you're asked the capacitance. Well, they very kindly already given us uh, the equation. We know, we know that C is 4 pi epsilon naught R. So that becomes 4 times pi times epsilon naught, which is on your data sheet, and is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And again, as long as you've converted that radius, we shouldn't have a problem there. Uh, so your capacitance should come out as 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11 farads. Um, you could hear they, they allowed you to have one significant figure, because of, I suppose because of... I don't know why they would allow you to have one significant figure. They probably shouldn't. Um, but it should definitely be two significant figures, because we've got uh, a two sig fig. That's not a useful pen. Uh, a two sig fig uh, unit uh, number there. Then you're asked for the charge required to raise uh, the potential on the sphere from zero to 7.0 times 10 to negative 5. Well, we already have the capacitance, so again, it's nice and easy. Just use the generic equation Q is CV. Uh, so I'm going to find Q, so I don't need to do any rearranging. I just substitute in my capacitance, 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11, and multiply that by the potential change, which is 7.0 times 10 to the 5, which comes out to 2.8 times 10 to the negative 5 coulombs of charge. Well done for sitting through all that. Uh, if you have any questions about anything on these uh, questions, Feel free to ask your teachers.